are getting ready to go on what's probably going to be the hardest elk hunt of the season here in southwest Montana. General tag, second week of season, 63 degrees, warm temperature. The elk have already been shot at for a week, so they know season's open. They're going to be way up high, 8,500 to 10,000 feet in the ugly, nasty stuff. And we got to figure out how to find one of them. Because our buddies Carson and Sean from Gerber are coming to town and we want to do some gutting and gilling with the prototypes that they have. We'll see. Hopefully it works. If nothing else, this is going to be five days of a lot of hiking and a lot of glassing. My name is Carson Cuevisto. I'm a product manager at Gerber Gear out in Portland, Oregon. Been doing it for about eight years. And uh, ever since I started there, I've been just getting more and more interested in hunting. I started there, I'm what Michael calls an adult onset hunter. I started there, I'd never hunted, wasn't part of our family. And within the first four months, I'd bought five guns and was hunting every everything that was in season. You make good products by getting into the field, getting in touch with consumers, and doing the actual activities that that will lead to insights that create better products. I think one of the other mantras we have is, um, what is the consumer doing and how do we make the doing of that thing better? So if our consumers in the hunting space are cutting up elk, how do we make the cutting up of elk better? How do we make the butchering process, the field dressing, the gutless method, all of that? How do we make that better for our users? And that's our goal, that's why we're out here. Selfishly, I'm also out here because I freaking love, I love elk hunting, yeah. I, I don't know, I don't know a better place I could be. I don't know a luckier person that works at a knife company in Portland than myself. I get to be out here in the high mountains of Montana chasing after these majestic animals and call it work. I mean, that's a gift. So last year in Arizona, Carson came down and he just wanted to tag along on a hunt that we did with Jerry Pritchard. And this year, Carson called me and said, hey, I see there's some Montana tags left over. Any chance I, if I were to snag one of them in the leftover draw that we could do an elk on? I said, yeah, we can do that. I have an opening the second week of season, but I'm here to warn you, it's the hardest week of season to try kill a bull elk. Last week we were here in Montana and we had guests then, uh, Lucas Burt from Leupold and our buddy Bo Beatty from Wilderness Ridge Trail Llamas. And as we were hiking out of that trip, Bo asked me, Randy, who's going with you next week when the Gerber guys come to town? Well, I got Carson and I got Sean from Gerber, but other than that, nobody. And Bo said, well, I'd like to come and help out and bring my llamas and help you with camp. And if you know Bo Beatty, when he offers something like that, you take him up on it. We're living big, folks. We are living big. <laughs> Who needs a motel when you got Bo Beatty, right? <laughs> right? Really, folks, the reason Bo is so good at this, he does all these summer pack trips in Yellowstone, in the Frank Church, in Capitol Reef National Park, Grand Teton National Park, the Jedediah Smith, the Wind Rivers. He takes groups of 10 to 15 people and sets up this kind of camp for all of them and he loads it all on his llamas. So for Bo, this is kind of just run of the mill average. And uh, he kept telling me about it. I said, all right, Bo, I want to find out what it's like to come to one of your luxury camps. So he said, all right, I'll be there. I'm, even if I don't shoot an elk, I'm going to gain weight on this trip by the looks of it. So that's something good. As much as Bo being here spoiled me, I'll admit that by the time we're into the third month of the season, I'm really tired of doing all the camp stuff, doing the cooking, all the chores. And so when Bo offered this, I said, man, I can't thank you enough. And I think Bo wanted to get to know the Gerber guys a little bit, and he wanted people to understand more about how his llamas worked. And Bo also is a serious hunter. And anytime a serious hunter says, I'll come and be an extra set of eyes and I'll help with all the camp stuff, this time of year, I'm, I'm all ears. So thanks, Bo. 
Michael, here's yours. Thank you, sir. How nice of you. For the first morning of the hunt, I told Carson, you know, I've shot two bulls back in this area. Uh, it's steep, it's a grunt, it's not any fun, but I don't think we're gonna have any hunting pressure in there. And maybe if we get back in there, they're at the head of this basin, you can pretty much glass everything to the east and the south, and it, it's a really good spot. And if the bulls come out of their summer areas, Sometimes they, they hit this main canyon that has a lot of traffic and they come over the divide into this basin that we're hunting. But it, it's a crapshoot. There's no guarantee they're gonna be in there. And you're, you're gonna put your effort in to get there. Because the season's been open for 10 days and it's the post rut. These bulls have figured out that it's hunting season. And they're way back at the head of these drainages. So we got up this morning, hiked in here, and we're gonna set up for the whole day back in one of these places right here where we can glass the whole back end of a drainage. What happens is these bulls, they just hang up here waiting for more weather. They're not gonna go down where the cows and calves are. So there's a band about mm, 8,500 feet and higher where this time of year when we don't have a lot of snow and when our daytime temps are in the 50s, they're just gonna be in these dark basins. And we're only in here about three miles, two and a half miles, but uh, the topography, the steepness, usually thins out most people from coming in here. So when bulls do come in here, they feel pretty secure and pretty safe. If you see them, you're able to usually get a stock on them. We spent the whole day glassing. And I know some people are gonna say, gee, Randy, maybe you should have kept moving and kept moving. No, this post rut period, this late season period, these rifle hunts that we have in the Northern Rockies in this late October, all of November, it's a glassing game. You are just picking apart every little piece you can. You know that those bulls come in there and they just stay there. And if you wanna go into those areas and try bump them out of their beds well you'll probably bump them out of their beds but the odds are you're not going to get a shot so that's the strategy is just glass and glass and glass and glass and the beauty of having multiple people is you can kind of take shifts someone can take a nap while everyone else is glassing that person gets up they glass someone else takes a nap and you'll see it a lot of times in our footage that when it gets cold and windy like it was on this day, we build a fire and just glass right from the fire. There's no reason to stay there and freeze to death. You'll get a feel for how high up we are because we're seeing mountain goats. That's the kind of country that we're hunting these bull elk in on public land in, the late, in this late part of October. Most of these bulls, the mature bulls on public land, are in these kind of places that, that you see us hunting here on this first day. It's just, it's tough sledding. I'm gonna have to apologize to you guys for not showing you an elk today. <laughs> we'll make it up tomorrow. <sighs> Sorry, folks. This is how it goes in a post rut hunt. Takes a lot of looking, a lot of hiking, and a lot of luck. Maybe this will weather's gonna be our luck. I think so. Could be. Well, after the results of the first day, I kinda knew, all right, that basin 
doesn't have any elk in it. We haven't had enough weather to really push anything. I'm gonna go to the next spot. And in this spot, I've also shot an elk. And it's again, another one of those climb up a really steep ridge, get up there and glass. Last night we got about two inches of snow. We need about 10 more inches to really get the elk to start staging closer to their, these, trans, these transition areas that I hunt. The summer range is up here, let's say, in this area above 9,000 feet. Their winter range is down here in the valleys, let's say five to 6,000 feet. The transition range is in between and it's got these differences in steepness and topography. Just about as soon as the first snow comes, the cows, calves, maybe even some younger bulls are gonna be down in the lower half of the transition range, closer to the winter range. The old bulls on public land, they come down last. When we have as little bit of snow and the warm temps we've had for the last 10 days, they are almost on their summer range or just off it, that's how high up they are. What happens is it's not like these bulls get a bunch of snow and they just go to the winter range right away. They come down and they stage in certain areas in the transition range based on the cold, the snow, the hunting pressure, other things. Hunting pressure will keep bumping them back up. Well, right now, day 12 of our general season or whatever it is, warm weather, no snow, has the elk bumped way up to the top of the transition range. If we were to get a foot of snow, it'd bring them down here, kind of in this band we're at, 8,500 feet here. We're at 8,500, we're glassing peaks that peak out, I think, 10-2, 10-3, something like that. So we're glassing where they're staging right now. It's just, whether or not they're gonna step out, whether you're gonna see one of them. And I mean, when you see some shots of this country, it's rough, ugly, nasty stuff. Well, we finally saw some elk this evening. Unfortunately, it's all cows and calves and yearlings. They're on a ridge over there. I was hoping if there were some bulls, it'd give us a location to go in the morning. Saw some mountain goats, saw some mule deer, and a group of elk. But just gotta keep looking, keep looking, keep looking. Sooner or later, we find a bull and we make a plan either to get them that day or go in the next morning. Darn it. Tell you what, when the sun goes down, it gets frigid. I'm sure it's dropped at least 10 degrees. And when it goes the rest of the way down, it's probably gonna drop another five. We got about an hour and 20 minute hike out of here. So we're gonna glass till the last little minute of daylight, put the headlamps on and Head back to camp and Bo Beatty says we're having moose burgers tonight. I know Carson and Sean are thinking, is this what we're going to do every day? But there was some method to my madness. The method to my madness was to determine if the elk had crossed the divide and come over. If they haven't crossed the divide and come over, which it appears based on the first two days that they haven't, then we gotta go hunt where the elk are. We gotta go over on the other side of the divide. From our camp, it's a big long loop to get over there. You either go around that way or around this way, but that's gotta be where the elk are. If they're not on this side, that means the weather hasn't been enough to push them yet. The good news is looking at the forecast, day three is supposed to bring us some weather. When we're driving in that morning, there's two or three inches of fresh snow and there's been another vehicle that went in before us. The very first spot that I pull out, I always stop there because you can probably see three miles 
And sometimes the elk are migrating along those faces. Sometimes they're down lower. And I pull off and I get to look in. I'd say within three or four minutes, I see an elk. And then I see some more elk. And then I see some more elk. And then the cool part was they were down pretty low. We're driving into the trailhead on this other side. There's three groups of elk working their way up the saddle here. We're trying to see if there's any bulls in the group. I think most of the elk have bedded, which is normal. The sun's about above the horizon, so what we're gonna do go up to the trailhead, figure out a plan to get above them for the day and wait till they come out. Hope that there's a bull in there. We didn't see them all. So with any luck, there's one bull in the group and we'll get a chance to have Carson lay him on the deck. We drive up to the trailhead, we start getting ready and the wind comes and the snow comes where the visibility is zero. For all practical purposes, you did not need binoculars because you, you couldn't see. It, it's blowing snow. It's almost like a mist of fog mixed with snow with sleet. And so I told Carson, I said, you know what? Until this clears, we're just gonna have to wait it out. And if we can wait it out and we see where those elk are, I marked it on my GPS before the, all the weather rolled in. I know where they're at. But we gotta make this great big loop to get to them. As soon as that fog goes away, I'm gonna shoot the giant seven by seven that's sitting right behind that tree. And I'm gonna save the little raghorn for Randy. And so we waited and we waited and the weather just got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. I felt bad for Carson because we'd spent the first two days looking for elk and didn't find any. And now when we finally found them, the, the weather gods decided, you know what, Carson, today's not your day either. Uh, there's nothing you can do. I've tried to go in on elk before with zero visibility. When you have wind swirling like that, when you have all the things against you, you're, you're just, you're gonna waste your opportunity. The best thing we could do, as hard as it is, the best thing we could do is just wait it out and come tomorrow. So when we woke up the next morning, the good news was the weather had cleared a little bit. Last night was Halloween. We got some dirty tricks to play on the elk this morning. You ready? Absolutely. Michael, are you ready? Yep. All right. Let's go. Let's go. We no more than started up in there. I think we had, our loop was gonna take us a little over four, four and a half miles to get above them. All of a sudden the wind is howling and the visibility is shutting down. And to complicate it, we get about a mile, mile and a half from where I want to be. And we're walking down the trail and I look in the snow and I look at Bo and both he, both Bo and I spend a lot of time in grizzly country. And instantly we're both like, I know what that is. That's a sow and cubs. So yeah, one, two, three, four bears. And one of, these are not, this is the sow right here, the bigger one. We can't tell which way because the wind and snow has blown them in this morning when it snowed. So the question becomes, have we already walked past them or are we walking into them? Mm -hmm. <sighs> not what I wanted. We'd already went this far, so I told the guys, look, we're just gonna be cautious, we're gonna be careful, we're gonna make a little bit of noise. I think 
we got on their trail. I think they're already up that way. We're just gonna be careful because the sow and cubs has a small home range. They're probably within two or three miles of wherever we're gonna be. We're just gonna keep our head on a swivel and make sure we don't do anything stupid. We got in here to where those out were. Yesterday we made a big loop around them. We know that they haven't got out of here. We would have seen their tracks in this fresh snow. So we gotta wait for this fog to lift. You can't see 100 yards probably. So we're gonna go over into these trees, build a fire, get out of the way and wait for the fog to lift. See if they're still here. If they're not still here, it's been a really big walk. Unfortunately, we never had visibility of more than 200 yards. And most times it was 40 or 50 yards. I don't know how you could come up with worse luck than Carson's been having on this hunt. We finally find elk and now you can't see. You can't see anything. If those elk were right out in that meadow in front of us, we wouldn't be able to see them. That's just bad, bad bad luck but no matter what happens out here this is a dream hunt and this is the coolest experience ever so let's just make sure that's straight no matter if it's an elk or not this is amazing it's like the coolest countryside it's just cool to be out here with these guys even michael even the camera guy he's even all right <laughs> so annoying you can see and then you can't see. You can see and then you can't see. I still haven't been able to see more than 200 yards today. What, what good does this do? Binoculars don't do you any good. Got these wonderful pair of Leupold BX5 Santium HDs. They are not able to see through fog like any binocular can. I don't know what to do. Once again, we finally see another mountain goat. The wind blows the clouds out and we, we see this little bit of a ridge up above us. And I thought it was a grizzly bear at first. I've never seen a mountain goat that was that brown in the back. Then it turns and walks along this ridge and you could see it was a big old billy, just a dirty old billy. I'd say we got about an hour and a half to two hours out, so. We got about an hour and 45 minutes of shooting light left so um, kick out our fire and start the trek out hope we hope we don't run into any grizzlies and hope we find a bull elk for carson to shoot Well, after the fourth day, we're back at camp that night and Bo's got another great meal cooked. And uh, I told Carson, I said, you know what? I, uh, all I know to do is go back around the other side and hope for some visibility. And that's what we're gonna do right at daylight. We're gonna be back in there. And if we get some visibility, maybe we'll have a chance. Clear visibility of 20 yards, limited visibility out to 100, and no visibility past that. We're not gonna waste another day sitting here in the fog, so we're going to find some out somewhere else. Little change of scenery. We were just down at another trailhead where we were glassing, couldn't see anything, so we thought, well, before the rain comes, 
Let's go break down our camp, load it up, and spend the afternoon hiking way back to the top end here. So that's what we're gonna do. If nothing else, we're gonna stay warm. About noon, we shouldered our packs and we start up the trail. And we're just going and going and it starts raining. We get further in elevation, the rain turns to kind of a sleep. And then we get up way high where I want a glass and now it's snowing. So I climb up to this bench and I get up there and I look and there are three bull tracks that had to be pretty fresh given how hard it had been snowing that day. I knew that they couldn't be too far ahead of us. The real question becomes, are they gonna side hill in bed? Out on, there's some, some other little fingers that I've hunted out to our, our west. Are they gonna go up and over? Or are they just gonna keep right on trucking around the mountain? I don't think those tracks are that old. This is the big all in, big push. It's the great finale. Yeah. So Carson's gonna follow those tracks. Michael's going to be right behind him, and those tracks are going to take us hopefully downhill. Because if they start going uphill, I'm turning downhill because I know what it's like here to get cliffed out up there. And uh, you know, but right where my trekking poles are, that's where they walked out. So. They stopped right here, took a hard left, and ran right up the freaking 45 degree mountain. And uh, I don't, it doesn't sound like we're gonna chase them, but it seems a little too slick and a little too risky to, to run up that hill. And we don't have enough time really before shooting lights up. Uh, it's 5.45 right now, and we only got camera light for another 30 minutes, shooting light for another hour. So uh, I think we're gonna turn Feel bad for Carson, he can't catch a break on this hunt. Between the weather, the terrain, the finally get on some fresh tracks, and we run out of daylight. Nothing you can do about it. Stay safe and live to hunt another day. Sometimes you go, and the very first morning, there he is, boom, you shoot him. It's like, I didn't deserve that elk, but I'll take him. And then some days you go, and for five days, you work your butt off. You face terrible conditions. Maybe you face a bunch of hunting pressure. Whatever it is, you feel like you've earned it and you deserve it. But there's no justice in hunting. I know this. Anyone who hunts as hard as Carson does and has as much energy as he does, they're sooner or later gonna get their opportunity. And once it happens, it's gonna seem like, well, it wasn't that hard. Why, why did it take, why didn't this happen every trip? If Carson ever comes back, he certainly has earned an elk with this trip. I hope the next time he comes to Montana, <coughs> there's a really nice one standing right at the trailhead, slightly uphill, about 200 yards from the road. Boom, he deserved it. And this was a classic example of how a post-rut hunt, how hard hunting can be in late October on public land, especially the second week of the season when there's already been a lot of hunting pressure. You really, really gotta work at it and you need a little bit of good luck. <laughs>